morning. Welcome to worship at Tremont United Methodist Church. I'm Kathy Clark and I am the associate pastor here. We are so very glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Just want to share just a couple of announcements. Um, pastor Larry is going to host an online discussion group and there is still time to sign up for that. It's based on the book Long Story Short and he is asking that uh, everyone purchase that book. You can do that online. You can uh, get a hard copy of that or, or get a Kindle copy of that and you can still sign up for that discussion. There is a link on our website too, if anyone in the community has needs during this difficult time, we have a group of people willing to make grocery trips and other errands, um, anything that you may need, uh, please go online and let your needs be known. Just a reminder too that the front door of the church is always unlocked for food donations that we are still accepting for our local food pantry and weekend snack bags distributed through the school. So with that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we are, we are ever mindful of your presence among us. And we just want you, Lord, to bless our worship this morning. We ask you to do that so that it's pleasing unto you. Everything that we offer you, Lord, take it and shape it so that it is pleasing unto you. Help us to worship you, Lord, with glad hearts and open minds. Help us to hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us worship the Lord. Holy, holy.
of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. together. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us, for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where all are brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of the righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. We have an opportunity now, as we do every time that we gather, to give back to God his tithes and our offerings. And we want to just first say thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. Even though we're not gathered together, we still have made a promise and to continue to tithe. And so you have multiple options for that. You can mail a, a check to the church as we are continuing to um, get the mail and take care of the mail. So that's not an issue. Or you can give online. Or you can use the um, QR scan um, that is located on your screen. 
So let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for this opportunity. Father God, out of the richness of your blesses, of your blessings, Lord, you, you bless us so much and so richly, so deeply. And your people have been so faithful during this time that we come humbly before you now, Lord. And I just ask that you bless this time of, of giving. Lord, you know that this is a difficult time. And so I pray that your people respond to this by giving when, whichever way they can, Lord, through their, their, their tithe of whatever that may look like, Lord. Maybe, maybe that is whatever resource that you've gifted them with. Lord, we thank you for that. As we are all in this together, helping one another through it, Lord, we ask that you bless us and that you equip us and that you continue uh, to see us through this, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to give back in relationship to that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We also have a time now of, um, where we just take all of the needs that you have continued to share with us. Uh, please know that uh, we continue to take um, requests from the prayer chain. It's still going. And uh, even though we aren't gathered on Sunday morning in the church, we still are the church. And so we would ask for each one of you to pray for one another. Once again, let me to remind you to just take out that um, our guide uh, that you have, our pictorial, dust it off, look at it, and take a look at the family that's before you and the family that comes after you or any of the families and pray for them. Give them a call. Write them a note. Just check in on one another. Um, I've been doing that, and these the calls and the answers that I've received have been so overwhelming. Um, just a thank you for checking on me. So let's do that as a church family. Let's continue to pray for one another. So let's go to the Lord in prayer with um, all of our brothers and sisters in mind. Let's take just a few minutes of silent prayer, and then we'll lift up our requests. Oh, Father God, we come to you this morning and we are so grateful for your blessings, for the way in which you continue to reach out to us and, and call us during this, this difficult time of, of separation. Even though we are se separated, Lord, we know that you have not separated yourself from us. We come, Lord, with a hunger and a thirst for you. If ever there was a time that we need to hear your voice or sense your presence, it is at this time. So, Lord, as we, as we crawl up into your lap and, and we, we sit and we allow you to hold us, we lift up to you the needs and the concerns of our brothers and sisters those that are, are grieving, we especially think of the family of, of Bob Moore. We think of those, Lord, that are facing medical tests, walking the road of, of cancer. Those, Lord, that have just asked for prayer and have not really put a voice to that need. Lord, for those that are struggling financially, Struggling, uh, maybe mentally, Lord, with this disconnect that we all feel. Struggling in any way. We know, Lord, that you are still God. You are still on the front throne. You are still in charge. And although we have many questions, there is no question in your mind. You've got this. And it's a time for us to trust you. And so, Lord, we, we do that. We trust you. We lean into you. And we ask for forgiveness, Lord, for any, uh, any sin, Lord, that has is, that is maybe left upon our hearts. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to provide for your people. 
And Lord, I might just add that if there is a need that we aren't recognizing, Lord, bring that to our attention. As we still are the hands and feet of Christ, equip us to be that, Lord. Lead us to that need. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength. saw in that video, Selah loves her puzzles. Really, both of my girls do. They've got animal puzzles and movie puzzles and ocean puzzles. 
Me? I don't have the patience for puzzles. I do have uh, some kind of deep and strange respect for those crazy jigsaw people who do puzzles like this one. I can just do a puzzle like this one. I know you're really impressed. I'm not crazy about geometry, and I just can't see myself sitting around for hours on end figuring out where all of the pieces go. But one thing I notice when the girls work on some of their harder puzzles, or I'm watching those crazy jigsaw people, is that it helps to look at the box. Sometimes if you want to figure out the puzzle, you have to look at the box to see the big picture. Today we're beginning a new sermon series to give us the big picture of the book, the Bible. And for a lot of us, our relationship with the scriptures is like how I approach puzzles. You've looked at a piece or two, maybe a couple of verses here or there, and you've never quite figured out how it all uh, fits together. And if we look at the Bible only in isolated pieces, it's really hard to understand. And taken out of context, we can make the Bible say all sorts of things. I had a professor in seminary who would always say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever the heck you want it to mean. Here's what I mean by that. You can make scripture justify anything you want. I can justify my fatness with scripture. Leviticus 3.16 says, all fat belongs to the Lord. Woohoo! Not really. It's about how to properly offer animal sacrifice. Or as I notice more and more gray hair on my head and through my beard, Proverbs 20.29 in the English Standard Version, the splendor of old men is their gray hair. Bring on the splendor. Or how about this one that I I loved in high school that I used uh, to tell people that it was okay that we were TPing our neighbor's houses. Zechariah 5, 1 through 4, and it has to be in the King James. Then I turned and I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, a flying roll. And he said to me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Then he said unto me, this is the curse of, that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. We were cursing those people. Then there's the other extreme, of course, where scriptures are taken out of context and uh, that out of contextness has been used to harm people, to justify egocentrism, sexism, or even abuse. There are several verses in the Bible, including Ephesians 6, 5, that were used by slave owners to oppress people. Ephesians 6, 5 says, "'Slaves, obey your earthly masters.'" with respect and fear. That's out of context. In the context, we find that the Greek word for slave also means servant and bond servant. So we're primarily talking about uh, indentured servitude here. Bond servants were given a surprising amount of legal and civic standing, and they, they were working to pay off their debt. And remember the Sabbath laws of the Old Testament required that all debts be forgiven and all servants be set free every seventh year. Scripture has been uh, used to justify abuse and control in relationships. Ephesians 5, through 23 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. I know I've already triggered some women out there with this one. And it's okay because this verse taken out of context really triggers me too. Just before Ephesians 5.22, and in verse 21, Paul writes this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And then he goes on to say, the part that nobody ever mentions when using this for abuse, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And how does Christ love the church? He goes on, he gave himself up for her in order to make her holy and cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Husbands are the head of the wife in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. And how is it that Christ leads the church? Christ makes the church grow. He feeds it and cares for it, gives himself up for it. He holds the church together, builds it up, edifies it. It's not about husbands being the head in terms of authority or supremacy, It's the context of Christ giving himself up for and nourishing the church. This whole passage that's often taken out of context is about mutual submission. We submit to one another 
The husband should love his wife by helping her grow, nourishing and edifying her while giving himself up for her, loving her as himself. The wife submits to her husband by being loyal to him, and the husband loves his wife by sacrificially giving himself up for her. It's not about an authoritarian power struggle. It's real sacrificial love as husband and wife submit to one another under the authority of Christ. Rant over. Other scripture passages seem, well, impossible. Like when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I'm disqualified. There are many other verses in the Bible that have led many people to state that the Bible is archaic, that it's out of touch, that it bears no authority over our lives today. And as Christians, we live in a tension there because the church has always taught that Scripture is the true authority when it comes to faith and practice We believe that scripture is the primary means by which we discover God's will for our lives. Yet often we live more like the people who have thrown out the Bible as being out of touch. Either we've bought into that idea or we're so frustrated by our lack of understanding that we've just laid it aside. I think those tough verses, and those are just a few of them that I've mentioned, only make sense when we see the bigger picture of the Bible. So for today and for five weeks after this, we're going to take a 10,000-foot view of the big picture of the Bible. And there are two things I'd like to accomplish with this series. First, I hope that you will gain an understanding of the overarching narrative story of the Bible. I'm basing this series on a book by Josh McNall called Long Story Short. He's a theology professor, but he has a creative way of helping people to easily understand the Bible. Uh, And in in his book, he breaks down the entire story of Scripture into six parts. Think of it kind of like binge-watching a good Netflix series that has six seasons. Creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, church, new creation. I'd love for you to get a copy of the the book. Here's a picture of the cover, and and there's a link on our Facebook page and in the description of this worship service. Get the book, join the discussion group on Tuesday nights, follow along each week. I promise you, you'll even find yourself laughing as you read this book. Speaking of following along, the second thing I hope God might do in these six weeks is increase our biblical literacy as a foundational practice in our church. I know in my own life, and it's true in countless churches as well, that the most influential practice to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus is daily engagement with the scriptures. There was a study done of hundreds of churches and over 80,000 people that came to this conclusion. Reflection on scripture is much more influential than any other personal spiritual practice. This is important stuff. It's hard stuff, but it's important. The Bible is the oldest, most verifiable book about God that we have. It's the most read, sold, copied, translated, and scrutinized book of all time. And it's actually 66 books written by over 40 authors over a span of over 1,500 years in two primary languages. The words of the Bible have shaped human history more than any other work. People have gained far more than knowledge by reading the Bible. They've experienced the transformation that comes from encountering God. Because as as Christians, we believe that the authors of Scripture wrote under the supernatural inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that what we read here truly is the Word of God. Paul told young Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. So to understand the Bible, to understand the nature of God and allow ourselves to be formed in the scriptures as our authority, we have to start, shocker, at the beginning. And George Acevedo down at Grace Church in Florida teaches that understanding the first few chapters of the Bible is a top button issue. Here's what he means by that. When you're buttoning a shirt, if you don't get the top button right, the rest of it's not going to line up. The first few pages of the Bible help the rest of the story to line up. If we get this part wrong, the rest of the story won't make sense. So let's start at the very beginning, beginning season one, chapter one. This is where the story begins. Your story, my story, wrapped up into God's story. What does the Bible tell us about how God created the universe? There are, there are so many different ancient creation stories, and most of them are pretty similar to one another. 
The world comes into existence usually as the result of a cosmic power struggle uh, or, or war between different gods. It, it's called creation out of conflict or, co- or chaos. And almost all of them have this unifying theme of creation out of conflict or chaos, except for Genesis. It's strikingly different in its account of how creation happened. It's so different than any other creation account. And you're gonna hear me say this a lot over the next six weeks. The stories in the Bible are too unlikely to not be true. If Genesis were just a made up account of creation, it would look just like every other ancient creation story, but it doesn't. The creation story is different. It's different in how God creates and why God creates. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter one, verses one through four, and then 26 through 28. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Then to verse 26, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. What does the Bible teach us about why and how God created our universe? First, God created the universe completely and purposefully. When you read the creation story in Genesis 1, you're introduced to the seven days of creation where God creates the world out of nothing. And and right there, that already causes some headaches for a lot of people. Because when we read that, it looks like six 24-hour days of creation, and it doesn't seem to line up with what science has discovered. So here's my bias. Do do I think that God could have created in six 24-hour periods? You bet, he's God. But I also think that that Genesis isn't attempting to give us a scientific accounting of the creation. What we're meant to get here in the opening pages of the Bible is a theology of creation. And the creation narrative communicates to us about who God is, what his powers are, who we are, how we relate to God, others, ourselves, and how we relate to the creation as a whole. So the most important thing we're meant to take away from this account is that God created the universe out of nothing, by his own hand in design and free will, not as the result of war or chaos or, or a random explosion of gases and atoms. Even the gases and atoms had to have come from somewhere. In Genesis, God creates the universe with intentionality, completely and purposefully. This is repeated over and over again in the declaration that we see in the story, and God saw that it was good. If you're one of those people who follows along in your Bible, circle that word good. It's repeated five times just in this narrative. God creates, he calls it good. God creates humanity, he calls it very good. And Dr. Bill Arnold says that the goodness in creation was exactly what God had in mind. It is just what God ordered, no more and no less than perfection and completely satisfying to God in every respect. It's like God as an artist stands back to admire his work and God is so pleased with the result that all he can do is say, that's good. Good means that the creation is complete. Nothing is missing, it's perfect. So here we begin to see God's nature. While the other creation gods are imagined as flawed, power hungry, jealous, even predatory, the Bible helps us to see God's nature in a totally different way. God's creation is good because he is good. God's creation is perfect because God is perfect. God's creation is complete because he himself is complete. And we learn something in these opening verses of of, of Genesis, not only about God, but about ourselves as well. When we look at verses 26 and 27, we see where human beings, where we make our grand entrance to the story of creation. 
Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. In the other creation myths, humanity was created to do the chores of the gods, But the Bible teaches us that human beings are made uniquely and special above all other created life. We were made completely and purposefully, made completely and purposefully in the image of God, in an image that's good, complete, perfect. And the image of God within us means that just like God, we are able to reason and make choices. We have the responsibility for leadership over creation, that that we can make moral decisions More than anything, the image of God within us creates in us a hunger for a relationship with God. All people are created uniquely and completely and purposefully in the image of God. Some just don't know it yet. Others haven't submitted themselves to living under God's authority and living into that image. And other times we can all agree we simply forget. We're created in the image of God to reflect God's image in the world. And there's a purpose in reflecting that image. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we start to see the purpose of humanity. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. I love that our story begins in a garden. You'll remember from last week and Holy Week that Jesus prays for our rescue and our redemption in the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you've read the end of the book in Revelation, you know that our story culminates in a new garden. The imagery that's introduced in these first verses of Genesis tie the whole story of Scripture together. The role that humanity is given is to tend and watch over what God has entrusted. Christine Kane's a phenomenal Bible preacher, and she says that we were not only created on purpose, but for a purpose. When we wake up each morning, we have a reason to live We're made to bring glory to God in our work and in our daily lives. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We're created to show off the goodness of God in our world. What's that all mean for us? It means that you're not an accident. You're here for a purpose. A good God made you to reflect his image. You are God-dreamed, God-designed, and God-desired. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. We need you. The world needs you. You are unique in who you are. You are called to make a difference in this world because of the image of God that's within you in the complete and purposeful way you were created. So yes, God created the universe and us completely and purposefully And God created the universe from and for community. We've already looked at verse 26, but I want to look at it from a different angle. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Do you catch the plural there? Us, our, our. Why does Genesis use plural to describe God's conversation? Right here in these opening verses of the Bible, we catch our first glimpse of the Trinity, three and one, one and three. And no matter how hard I try, I know I've always come short of fully explaining how God is one, yet also three, Father, Son, and Spirit. I've often showed the scutum fide, the shield of faith, to explain that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, and so on. But the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but it still falls short of explaining the fullness of the mystery And personally, I'd rather follow a God that I can't fully understand than one that can fit inside my brain. Let's not create God in our image. Instead, just catch this first glimpse of the community of the Trinity. God exists in relationship. So when we're created, we're created for relationship. We're created for community. We're created from that community, and we're also created for community. Look at the next verse. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. Men and women both bear the image of God, but notice that the image of God is about community. 
When God creates, he does so in community. This is a huge part of the story of the Bible. The story of Israel is about community. When Jesus came, he was born into an earthly family in a village. He calls his disciples to come and form a community. When the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, he comes to a community gathered in Jerusalem. When God made you and me, he makes us a part of a family. In fact, the first crisis in scripture is not a moral one. It's a community one. In Genesis 2.18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Did you hear that? God has been saying over and over that things are good, that they're very good, and now something isn't good. It wasn't good for the man to be alone. It's as if God was saying, I didn't make my finest work, the one that I stood back and said, this is very good to go through life alone. I made humanity to be like me, to be in community, to be social. So God created a helper. And just like in Ephesians, the word helper has nothing to do with Eve being Adam's servant. The Hebrew word doesn't mean subordinate. It means perfect counterpart, like a cross. To be the one who comes and works alongside and walks with Adam through this life. The big idea is that God made us for each other. We're made for community. And that's one of the worst parts about the world we find ourselves living in right now with sheltering at home, with social distancing. We were made for community. We were made to be together. And long before all this started, we were already seeing the dangers of isolation in our culture. Cigna did a study that talked about an epidemic of loneliness. The CDC reports that suicide rates among youth is rising. A study from Vanderbilt found that depression is rising drastically in Gen Xers, people in their 40s and early 50s. God's answer to all of this is community, the family of God. It's one another. 58 times in the New Testament, the word one another is used. Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, urge one another, encourage one another, greet one another. On and on and on. God wants you to care for others and be cared for by others. And you've been doing that. You've been demonstrating what the beloved community of the church looks like in the way that you've been caring for one another with the cards you've been sending, the phone calls you've been making, checking in with one another on Facebook, finding creative ways to celebrate people's birthdays. You've been doing that well, and I know because I've been on the receiving end of that. You can't imagine the the how different all of this feels. You you can because you're living it too, but none of us ever thought that we would pastor through a situation like this. And it's hard. Ministry by its nature is social. It's in community. And to be six foot away from everybody, it kind of stinks. It changes the way that, that we approach ministry. But I can't tell you how many times over these last weeks when I'm sitting behind a computer screen uh, editing a worship service, about ready to throw my computer out the window, that just at the right time I've gotten a text message from somebody that doesn't say, hey, how are things going at the church? They say, how are you doing? That means a lot. That means a lot. It's, it's, like, it's like Moses when the battle was raising, the people holding his arms up because if his arms went down, they wouldn't win. And sometimes your pastors need their arms held up as well. The community, the beloved community of the church, we're made for. It's a place of encouragement for me. It's a place for you and me and all of us together to belong. This is our starting place. It's the top button. If we get this one right, all of the other buttons start to line up. All of the other pieces of the puzzle start to form together. God created the good universe and us completely and purposefully, out of nothing, by his own design, by his own free will, out of love. He created us from and for community. Out of the the relationship of love that exists within the Trinity, the overflow of that was the creation When we get this piece of the puzzle, we don't have to have all of the details right. We don't have to know if it was six 24-hour periods or if it occurred over a period of millions of years. What we have to get from this is that God created everything out of nothing by his design, by his purpose, completely, purposefully, from and for community. 
when we get this piece of the puzzle, everything else in scripture starts to fall into place. The story of the Bible is community. It's purpose. It's relationship with God and with the community of God. That's the long story short. That's the story of this book. And it can be your story as well. When we recognize that we are who he says we are, that we are created by him to do good works, that we are not alone, we are not abandoned, that God created us before we were ever uttered a word, before we emerged from our mother's wombs, God designed us. The psalmist says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are not on accident, we are on purpose, we are exactly who he says we are, and who he says we are are those who are made in his image and likeness from and for community. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that we are exactly who you say we are, that we are your beloved children, made in your image and likeness, that you have prepared for us before the foundation of the world good works to reflect your goodness in this world, to show off how great you are. And in this time where many of us feel isolated and, and alone, Remind us again that you are with us. You have not abandoned us. You have not left us. You are with us. And we are your children. We give you thanks for this top button, this first piece of the puzzle of how good and complete and purposeful your creation is. We thank you for your power in creation, for displaying your glory and your goodness that not out of conflict or chaos, but out of your love, out of your purpose and free will, you created everything. We worship you because of how good you are in creation and how fearfully and wonderfully made we are. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free.
In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I Do me a favor, go online and, and buy this book, long story short. Even if you don't participate in the discussion group on Tuesday nights, follow along. There's so much more in these chapters than what, what I'm able to capture in, in one sermon. And we're all working together to, to increase our biblical literacy, to, to increase our hunger for God's word. So it can be a foundation for our lives and a means for us to know God's will and to follow him. We've got the first piece of the puzzle, our creator God. Next week, we're, we're going to continue with the rest of the story, this long story short. Whatever this week holds for you, I send you with the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May that blessing go with you and remain with you always. Amen. Have a good week. Amen.